Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then, death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you, for all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven, if so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the self-same thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, we're always confident, knowing that whilst we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We're confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that where the present are absent, we may be accepted of him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that we may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it's to God, or whether we be sober, it's for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, Yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ 
and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we're ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation, giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. But in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the arm of righteousness, on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. O oh, ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you. Our heart is enlarged. You're not straightening us, but you're straightening your own bowels. Now for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children, be ye also enlarged. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Lord, make my life today a life of prayer that I may intercede for souls everywhere. Lord, give me a burden today for the lost on life's perilous sea. Help me guide them safely to Thee. Lord, help me, I pray. One sat alone beside the highway begging his eyes were blind, the light he could not see. He clutched his old rags and shivered in the shadows. Then Jesus came and bade his darkness flee. It's time to open the word once again with evangelist Lester Roloff on the Family Altar Program. For all is changed when Jesus comes to stay. We'll ask you to turn with us, please, to Matthew 10 and verse 8. I am going to speak, however, on the greatest crime of this generation. I know what it is. And I mean, I, 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 I just shiver and, 
and quiver when I think about what's happened in our generation. And I'm going to tell you what it is. In the book of Matthew, chapter 10, chapter 10, and verse 8. And, um, well, we better back up to the sixth verse, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Lost sheep. Didn't say lost goats, did it? It said lost sheep. Somebody's gotten lost. Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. Cast out devils. Why? Well, freely you've received. Freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses nor scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. Now I want to reread that for uh, a, a reason. He said, I want you to heal the sick. I want you to cleanse the lepers. In other words, sickness, it needs to be cleansed, he said. Raise the dead. Cast out devils. Freely you've received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses nor script for your journey. I tell you one thing. He sent those ignorant fishermen out and some of them I guess were not too well trained. But he told them, said, don't you take any script along. He said, I'll, I'll tell you what to say when you get there. I'll be right with you. And I believe that we need to depend on the Lord. What I'm saying is this. When we really live by faith, I'm not altogether against an outline, but I'm simply saying that young people need to memorize. What do you think God gave you mind for? And, and the preachers, we need to memorize the Word of God. Well, we've got to come now uh, to the subject, what is the crime? What is the crime of this day? Turn to the book of Matthew chapter 23. This greatest message that is ever brought in a in a denouncing way. This is absolutely, Jesus um, takes off the hood and absolutely exposes religion and uh, the Pharisees and the religious leaders. I'm not going to read the entire chapter, but I tell you, I've never in my life preached a sermon as plain as this. I've never been as hard on the modernists and the infidels as Jesus was. Why? Because they wouldn't, he said, you won't go in yourself and you won't let anybody else in. He said, you bunch of whited sepulchers, you generation of snakes. I mean, he told them right here, I'll guarantee you this. This is some chapter. This is some chapter on Jesus. And you know what he did? I've got to share a little of it with you because I realize that I'm speaking maybe to a million people out in the radio audience. And in order that you might see what Jesus, and we've got the same thing going on today. We got the same kind of preachers, the same kind of denominationalism, and 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 the same kind. You know, Jesus said, "Oh Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee," and still at it. I don't care where it. It may be the Methodist Jerusalem, it may be the Baptist Jerusalem. Won't make a lick of difference. They're killing the preachers. And practically every school we've got is nothing but a cemetery where they bury the preachers. Preachers go to school and come back without any fire and without any faith, and they come out doubting God and doubting the great things of the Word of God. I tell you, it's just sad. I, I wish it were not so, and if it were not so, I would not say it. But he said the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. They sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. That's religion without righteousness. They bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne. Lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works, all their works, they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. Love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. 
said, you'll know them by their clothes, said they make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the gar- borders of their garments, and they love the uppermost rooms at what? Feast? Didn't say it fast, did it? No. Chief seats, whereabouts? In the synagogues. Greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be ye not called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all your brethren. Now I'm going to stop long enough to get you ready. Are you willing to go ahead and believe the rest of what I'm going to read? I mean, it's going to be just as plain as what I've already read. And call no man your father upon the earth. Now you'd say, well, brother, the What does that mean? Well, I'll ask you a question. What did it say? (laughs) Hey, no need arguing with me. I'm not saying I'm reading the Bible. Now, it just said, call no man your father upon the earth. And I believe it's what it meant. And that's what I'm going to go by. The Bible said, call no man on the earth your father. No, no, we don't have, we just don't, that that closes it all out. For one is your father, which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. Now, Jesus is really stirring up a hornet's nest in this chapter. And he calls them scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. But uh, there's a particular verse that I'd like to share with you. It's 23 and verse 26. And he calls them blind, said, y'all are blind. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter that the outside of them may be clean also. Now then, Jesus always put the emphasis on the inside. And we put the emphasis, religion always puts the emphasis on the outside. Religion starts on the outside, and salvation starts on the inside. Jesus said first, number one, you get cleansed on the inside. Now, that's what I'm going to say when I begin to teach our people physically. The first thing you're to do is to get clean on the inside physically. Now, disease always starts on the inside, not on the outside. Disease can never hang on the outside unless it gets born on the inside. You remember that. Everything that's wrong with you is on the inside, not on the outside. You'd say, but I'm having trouble with uh, uh, pimples. That's an inside job we've got to get after. I'm having trouble with this. It's all on the inside. Spiritually, you'd say, I'm having trouble cussing. That's an inside problem. You've got to cuss it hard. You say, I have trouble lying. You've got a wrong heart on the inside. You get your heart fixed, you'll stop all that lying. Oh, if we could just get back where the Bible tells us to get, and that's on the inside. Get on the inside and clean out on the inside. Then there will be real spiritual help for God's people. Now, what is the crime? What is the great crime today? This is the most horrible crime I've ever heard of in my life, I've ever known. Uh, We ought to, as I've said, we ought to hang crepe on every doorknob in America, almost. The churches ought to go into full-time mourning and fasting over this crime. This is the most horrible crime that I've ever seen committed. You know what we've done? We've killed a generation of young people. We've murdered them. We've murdered their minds. We've murdered their souls and their bodies. This is the generation of murder for young people. Our young people have been murdered. Really, that's the truth. And uh, I see it better than I've ever seen it before. I see a whole generation of young people. The only thing we've got to build the next generation on, they've been murdered. Now, we talk about the, the Indian mother with her little olive skin baby as she takes it to the Ganges River and throws it into the crocodiles. We've done the same thing with our young people. We've thrown our young people at the television set. 
We've thrown them at rock and roll. We've thrown them at the dope needle. We've thrown our young people into the filth of this old generation. We've murdered our young people. That's the most terrible and that's the most tragic crime that's ever been committed. Now then, in a moment, I'm going to tell you who did it. Somebody, if we murdered them, somebody had to murder them. Now then, we certainly face a generation that has been murdered and uh, people that uh, have not found the way, young people that are confused, minds that are twisted and uh, torn. Now then, what's the cause? What is the cause of such tragedy today? Who would you name as the number one murderer? I think there are two murderers, and you know who they're going to be, don't you? There are two people that have killed our young people, murdered our young people. Now, we won't stand in the, in the courts of men, but we're going to stand in the courts of God, and we're going to give an account. And the first man that's going to give an account for murdering the young people is going to be the preacher. He's the man. He's God's key man. God called him and said, now look it, I'm going to put your watchman on the wall. I'm telling you to warn him and uh, I'm going to hold you accountable. The Bible said uh, uh, we are to uh, be sub subject to the rule of him who watches for our soul because he's watched for souls as they that must give an account. Hebrews chapter 13. And so the number one man in the world today is the preacher that's murdered our young people. You know why? And he did it in the name of trying to win them and get along with them. And I want to fix a place for them. And uh, our young people are going to be, we're going to build a recreational place for them. We're going to put a little lounge in the church and the TV and we're going to let them have some rock and roll and we're going to sponsor their dances. That preacher murdered his young people. And he's going to give an account to God some of these days for murdering a generation of young people. And then there's another man and that's the daddy. This has been a generation of women. Women have seemed like taken the lead, gone into businesses and politics, and they've uh, gone into money making, and they've uh, deserted the home, and they've left the children, and uh, uh, the husband, uh, many times I've had husbands and say, well, my wife makes more money than I do, and uh, she has her own bank account, and she has this and she has that. The cause, dear friend, we, we have, we have let, we, the men have failed. And as a result, you know what men have done? They've started wearing long hair, so they're going to take the place of the woman. They want to look like the woman now, and the woman got the husband's trousers and put them on, and, uh, she began to, she bobbed her hair, she bobbed her hair, and, uh, she, uh, decided she'd be a man. Man said, okay, I'll be the woman. And so he fluffs his hair and gets it, he gets it set, gets it fixed, so he gets it done. And uh, so that we have a sissy generation of men. Now, brother, whether you like it or don't like it, the men have failed to put the women and the children in their places. And you better listen to me tonight, because when we get out of Bible order, we get out from under Bible blessings. And when God doesn't bless us, then there's just one thing left. I, I really believe this, and, and this I don't mean to be unkind toward God now, but when God can't bless us, he'll have to curse us. Now, you'll either get the blessing or you get the curse. Just make up your mind which one you want. And you girls, whether you want to come under or don't want to come under, while you're here, you're to learn obedience. Or oh, when I think about what Jesus did, the Bible said that he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. Jesus learned obedience. He was obedient when he came. And yet the Bible said he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. Obedience to me is the very outstanding badge of being a real New Testament Christian. Now remember, I'm not trying to, and in my book that I wrote, I didn't say that you could be disciplined in to heaven. You can't be. But I tell you what you can be. When you get saved, your discipline ought to begin immediately. You know when my discipline started first, my first discipline, when I got born. I got born into H.A. Roloff's family, to my mother and my dad, and you know what they did? They started disciplining me. 
Now, you know when your discipline starts spiritually? When you get born again. And you'll never get out from under discipline. It'll be that way to the end of the trail. To the end of the trail. And don't be afraid of the word discipline. Don't be afraid of the word uh, commandment. Moses said over there, well, he said, uh, he said uh, this is your life. This is your life. Don't think it's a vain thing. It's not a vain thing. This is your life. This is the way you live. What is the cause? Well, let me give you this. Jesus said one day to the churches over in the book of Revelation, he said, you know what? If you do not repent, I am going to take the candlesticks away from you. You know what the candlesticks are? The candlesticks are the church. I mean, you see, the, the church doesn't have any light. Jesus is the light. But the candlesticks hold the light. And he said, I'm going to take the candlesticks away from you. Now, if you go read and then you go over there where the churches used to be, you won't find a one of them over there. Seven churches in Asia Minor, you won't find one of them. He named every one of them. You go over there and see. And, and I, that's really, now I don't care. Think about going, well, if I could go over there and find those New Testament churches like they used to be with the power of God moving and having revivals, I'd get over there and get my cup filled and come back here. And, and, and do, but they're not over there. They're gone. You know why? They did not repent and therefore, listen, Jesus started his ministry with the doctrine of repentance. He closed his ministry and the last message, the last message that he ever brought was a message of repentance and it's in the book of Revelation. He was asking the church uh, to repent and he said, unless you do, I'll take the candlesticks away and so the churches have been gone. Heathenism is over there now. Turn to the book of Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah. See, we're going, the Bible said that which hath been is now, and that which shall be hath already been. Chapter 2, verse 3, Israel was holding his past tense, was holding his under the Lord, and the first fruits of his increase, all that devour him shall offend, evil, evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. Now verse 5, thus saith the Lord, what iniquity have you fathers found in me? What did y'all find wrong with me? That they're gone far from me and have walked after vanity and are become vain? Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and pits, through a land of drought and shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through and where no man dwelled? I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when you entered, you defiled my land. Made in mine heritage an abomination. People's living just like they did back there then. Notice what he said. The priest said not, where is the Lord? And they that handle the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. Verse 11, hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They've, they've done two things that's wrong. What are they? First, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And then second, they hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. That's always true, isn't it? In our generation, we got rid of the big living stream of water. And now then we're, breaking, we're making us broken cisterns that can hold no water. The crime, we've murdered. The cause, we've gotten rid of the candlestick and the cistern with living water, the well of living water. And then this third seed, we have failed to recognize the divine call. I went through my Bible this morning thinking Abraham got a call. God called him and he heard his call. Samuel was called. He said, uh, 
speak, Lord, for thy servant. Moses was called. Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness, and then he got his divine call over at the burning bush. Amos was called down out of the sycamore tree and sent off to the city to preach to a modernist like Amaziah. He was called of God. We have failed in our generation, and I've seen it coming, to recognize the divine call to the ministry. Don't make a difference who you are. When God calls you, you're to answer. You remember Isaiah? He got a divine call. God said, whom shall I send? Who'll go for us? And Isaiah, after he got his lips cleansed, his tongue cleansed, he said, here am I, Lord. Send me. We need people that are divinely called. Do you believe God has a call on your life tonight? Do you believe that your life is important enough in the sight of God for him to have a special thing for you to do and a call for your life? I do. Are you listening? See, God's got a call on you. And I'd rather carry a coal bucket for Jesus and operate a gold mine for Satan, hadn't you? I really had. Oh, the divine call, the call that God puts in a man's life. God said, I'll take that which is naught, nothing, and make something out of it. I don't think I'd ever call me to preach. I never would. I just wouldn't even thought about that. I really wouldn't. But God did, and I'm glad he did. And did you know when God called me to preach, I didn't like it? Now, wouldn't it wouldn't wouldn't I wouldn't I've suffered eternal loss if if the Lord said, Well, son, you mean you don't want to pray? I said, No, sir, I don't. I'd just rather do anything than preach. Just suppose the Lord said, Okay, all right, son. That's the way you feel about it. I'll just go get somebody else. I'm glad he just put me in a ministry. Said, Whether you like it or don't like it, come on. Well, I said, Lord, if that's the way you put it, I'm gonna preach. And that's about the way it was, huh? And then the Lord fixed it where I just love it and live on it. I never have got to preach long enough. I never have. Ah, oh, listen. God's able to give you a call and make you love your call. See? God's people are to be different. There's a divine call. Moses had it. Samuel got it. Abraham got it. Amos and i tell you something else. Jonah got a divine call. You think he wanted it? No, he didn't want it. He didn't want it. And he went in the opposite direction. He paid the fire and went down. The Bible said three times he went down. That's where you go when you don't accept God's call, too. You go down. Listen, there is no way on earth to go up unless you go up with God. But God tells us to do something and we refuse to do it. There's no direction except down. Sometimes you get tired of the racket of life, don't you? You get tired of the burdens of life, don't you? Sometimes you get tired of the humdrum and the discipline. I know what time we're going to get up in the morning. We're going to be at school. We got, and I, I just get tired. Listen, did you know that's your training? What about the old soldier boy? has to get up, hear that old trumpet sound in the morning early, march out across the wilderness with a pack on his back and so forth, and uh, get in them old jeeps and go across them old hills and mountains and so forth. You think of what kind of friends you had in the world. You think of the friends you had in the world. Did you know what they were? I can name them. Did you know that they smoked? They shot dope? They were impure? They were immoral? And they had no contribution to make to your little life that would have been a good. You know that, don't you? Now then, why would you why would you worry about giving up a bunch of snakes like that? Why would you be upset? Why would you ever want to go back? You see, if you can get your appetite changed and your desires changed, God will bless you and make you. Now there's the divine call. But there's something else I'd like to say. There's the commandment and the communication. That's the next C. The commandment and the communication. Did you know the thing that's broken down the communication? 
And I, you know, I, I've been talking to a lot of the young people and they said one of the ways they seek to solve their problem is with what they call the rap. But you see, a young person that gets in the trap is going to take more than the rap to get him out of it. They talk about, we, we, we had a rap session. We had a rap session. And uh, that means they sit around and talk and jabber, but they never get anything done. Because they don't have any sense. They don't have the Bible. They don't have any real spiritual life. Ah, uh, listen, don't ever think that Jesus is going to trot out a new movement that's going to help you. We, we just need the old movement. Did you know that? We just need the Bible, the Word. There's nothing new. Don't be afraid to just memorize the Scripture and get on your face and pray and you go in your room and pray and spend your time uh, asking the Lord uh, to help you. There's got to be a commandment. People laugh at the commandments today, but the commandments are pure and sweet and good. The Bible said the commandment is holy and just and good, and it is. It's always going to be like that. The Bible's going to always be our only hope. The Word of our God uh, shall stand forever. And then, the secret of communication with each other is communication with the Lord. Now, I don't ever intend to be able to communicate with the world. I can't communicate with a lot of things down here. I really can't. I don't, uh, I'm not on the spree. I, I can't even communicate with the sports world anymore. I mean, God broke my communication line. And modern sports, as mighty, and, and the preachers might as well cry, modern sports have be, has become modern sin. There was a time when we went out on the school ground and we played baseball, but we did it for recreation. Now then, they do it for money or for pressure or to put a winning team on the field, and they've lost the joy of playing. You know, I had an experience one day. I was in a small plane, and I had a 50-mile headwind. And the plane wouldn't do but about uh, 120 that I was in. And you subtract 100 and you subtract 50 from 120, and I was going 70 miles an hour. I mean, I was just barely keeping up with the cars on the highway. And I tell you, I flew and flew and flew, and I watched the gas gauge, and I said, look at here, I'm not going to make it on these tanks of gas. And so I picked out a little town, and a nice runway, and when, oh, it was blowing. Fact is, I just picked me out a little cross runway and landed on it because I knew I'd, I wasn't going to land in that kind of a wind uh, with that little old light plane. And so I knew I could stop the plane in, in, in as long as this auditorium is, as strong as the wind was, because I'd be coming in. See, I'd be only going, I could slow down to probably 40 miles an hour with the wind coming against me, so I just landed and stopped. And I taxed it up to the pump. I said, I hope you didn't mind me landing the way. No, he said, help yourself. I said, I'm figuring on taking off the same way. He said, that's all right. I said, this wind, it's horrible. And then you know what he told me? He said, you know, last night, we had a twin engine to come in here. And he said, they hit this same wind. And he said, you know, and, and they came at night. And he said the, the whole bunch was drunk. He said the pilot, he said the pilot, he landed that plane and taxied down and said when he went up, when he rolled up to the pump, both engines quit on him. And he said, I told him, I put those tanks full of gas. And I said, sir, do you realize that you were completely out of gas? Well, he said... Uh, I thought something was wrong. I was taxing down them things was cutting off on me, coming down the runway. See, can you imagine that whole load of people were within five minutes of death and a drunk pilot flying that plane? You know there's nobody crazier than people without the Lord. Sin takes the wisdom away from you and takes the safety out of you and takes every precaution out of the communication. Now then, here it is. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask what you will, there's your communication. 
Prayer is not hard. Prayer depends not on your knowledge. It depends on your consecration. You've got to be right in your heart. He said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. The secret of a great life is a prayer life. I tell you, that to me is the bedrock of the Christian life. It don't make any difference what you may know and how much talent you have. If you don't stay in touch with the Lord, you're not going to be used of God. Prayer. I mean just communication. And it's got to be built on the, on the commandment. And then I'm coming to the final two C's. Number next to the last is where is your confidence? Where is your confidence? How much confidence do you have in Jesus? See, what I'm talking about is this. We've got to get to the place spiritually where we know Jesus is going to make all of our plans from here on. And uh, he's going to choose every choice. and He's going to put me right where he wants me. He's going to send an angel to go before me and pick it out. And then he's going to bring, the Bible says, bring me to the place which he'd prepared for me. Now, you see, that to me is Christian living. That's maturing in the faith. That's getting to the place. Do you believe that the Lord has a place for Brother Roloff more than he does you? I don't. I don't. Do you believe God's got all the plans made for your life? I do. Every one of them. Now, you know what doing the will of God is? It's just walking where he tells you to walk. And that's it. And he's got the plans already made. He's not going to have to. Now, when you were born, he didn't say, well, look at there. Another baby born. I've got to go make some plans. Oh, no. No, he already had them made. See, he knew. Long time. You know what Paul said? Paul said, I was called before I was born. I mean, God put the call on him before he was born the first time and before he was born the second time. God already had his plan. And, and that's how important people are to Jesus. And he's got a plan for every one of you. Now, you just don't need to get impatient about it. But just wait on the Lord. And this, to me, this, this is the preparation ground right here. I mean, we're preparing the soil. While I'm preaching tonight, I'm trying to get you to see that the Lord loves you and that he's got some special thing for you. But you know, the thing that's grieved me with our young people, their minds have been blocked. I mean, they, they've, God's been completely, the God of the Bible, the God of righteousness, he's been completely blocked out of the minds of our young people. Now, the last thing I want to say, and that is, and this is, the, this is the answer right here. This is the cure, and that's Christ. Jesus said, come unto me, A-double-L, that's all. That means every color, every race. He said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest. Paul said, there's one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, neither is there salvation in any other, or there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. One lawyer, little children, I write unto you that you sin not, but if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And Jesus said, Him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. He said, Call upon me, I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know who's going to be saved tonight? The one who calls. You know the one who's going to find the will of God? The one who's willing to do the will of God. Thank you for joining us today on the Family Altar Program with Lester Roloff. And they were blessed. He gave the weary rest. He made the blinded eyes to see he fed the hungry soul and he made the wounded whole by the waters of blue galilee they sat at his feet and they looked in his face content in his presence to be for no one before had cared for their souls like the stranger who sat by the sea.